In the rich fabric of naval history, there is a narrative of incredible bravery and devotion that continues to touch the soul and inspire awe. It is a story laced with threads of heroism, sacrifice, and unflinching dedication to duty, one that transcends time and strikes a profound chord in the hearts of everyone who hear it. Amid the turbulent seas of World War II, a beacon of valor emerged in the form of a valiant naval commander whose name has since become synonymous with bravery and honor. His actions on the battlefield and behind enemy lines exemplify the very heart of naval tradition, courage in the face of adversity, compassion for colleagues in arms, and unflinching commitment to the principles of duty and service. Throughout the difficulties and tribulations of war, this courageous officer displayed extraordinary resilience and fortitude, meeting each task with steadfast determination and drive. In the darkest hours of captivity, he was a beacon of hope and inspiration, a bright testament of the human soul's unbreakable spirit. So, with heartfelt humility and appreciation, we celebrate his memory, the remembrance of a true hero whose legacy lives on through the christening of the USS Antrim FFG-20. As the ship sets sail across the great expanse of the ocean, it carries not just the name of a distinguished naval officer, but also the spirit of courage, sacrifice, and honor that he represented. I and the presence of his beloved family. We honor a life well lived, one distinguished by selfless service and unflinching dedication to duty. May his memory live on for eternity, a source of inspiration for future generations and a tribute to the enduring heritage of those who serve their country with dignity and distinction. It may be polite to focus solely on the great achievements of marine heroes, but in order to convey the full tale, it is necessary to acknowledge the flaws and shortcomings that many of our marine heroes had to overcome on their way to glory. Gregory Boynton undoubtedly had numerous defects and weaknesses. He was also able to acknowledge his flaws, if not conquer them, and learn from other guys when given sound advice. Those defects and failings never prevented him from serving his country and carrying out his duty as a United States Marine. Colonel Gregory Pappy Boynton, Rhett, USMC was the bad boy hero of World War II that America required in the Pacific Theater. He led the Black Sheep, an ad hoc squadron of flyers. Boynton's memoirs, Baba Black Sheep, published in 1958, chronicled Pappy and his accomplices' escapades. He writes after World War II when he has had time to reflect on his battle experiences and time as a prisoner of war. However, Boynton admits that the bad boy reputation was justified and possibly cultivated. He demonstrates that there is hope for excellence despite the mistakes, daredevils, and drunks. A television show in the 1970s popularized Pappy's Black Sheep among new generations. In 1970, a popular television show depicted Boynton and his squadron's eccentric and often insubordinate behavior. Released as Baba Black Sheep, with Robert Conrad as Boynton, it was renamed Black Sheep Squadron. In its second and final season, Boynton's unique but true-to-life features undoubtedly contributed to the series' mix of military drama and comedy. If some of the antics appear out of place, those who knew Pappy Boynton realized that it was an uncannily genuine representation of an unusual man and a remarkable Marine Corps hero. Pacific Northwest Culture Greg was born on December 4, 1912, in picturesque Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. The Idaho Panhandle has a stronger relationship to Washington State than Southern Idaho. It is dominated by a deep and beautiful lake and is presently regarded up and coming. It was very rural in the 1900s and was known as timber country. He is Irish and Brule Sioux, a Lakota tribe, blood and genetics. Native Americans proved their patriotism and battle spirit by defending the United States of America for decades before being granted citizenship. 
The Indian Citizenship Act of 1924 provided citizenship to the United States indigenous peoples. It was partially adopted to honor the thousands of Native Americans who fought in the military during World War I. The Irish are also known for their patriotism and willingness to experiment, especially when it comes to drinking. An extremely broad generalization, but one has to question if Boynton's DNA contributed to his proclivity for fighting and drinking. The family eventually moved to Tacoma, Washington, where he wrestled at Lincoln High School. Boynton graduated from high school in 1930 and went on to study at the University of Washington in Seattle, where he participated in Army ROTC. He competed for the Husky wrestling and swimming teams and once captured the Pacific Northwest Intercollegiate Middleweight Wrestling title. Wrestling was going to be part of his life after the war. He spent his summers in Washington working in mining and logging camps, as well as road construction with the Kerr Delane Fire Protective Association. In 1934, he received his bachelor's degree in aeronautical engineering. Aviation was plainly in his blood as he flew for the first time at the age of six. Boynton's first marriage took place in the fall of 1934. His wife, Helen Clark, was 17 years old and had three children. Greg married Helen under the name Gregory Hallenbeck. He worked as a draftsman and engineer at Boeing in Seattle. His parents, the Hallenbecks, had an apple ranch in Okanagan, Washington. Bending the rules. Hallenbeck was a member of the Husky Army ROTC program. In June 1934, following graduation, he was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the United States Army Coast Artillery Reserve. I then spent two months on active duty with the 630th Coast Artillery in Fort Wardens, Washington. In the spring of 1935, he filed for flight training under the Aviation Cadet Act, only to discover that married men were not eligible. Boynton grew up as Gregory Hallenbeck, believing his stepfather, Ellsworth J. Hallenbeck, was his biological father. However, when Greg received his birth certificate, he discovered that his biological father was Charles Boynton, a dentist, and that his parents separated while he was an infant. Greg truly wanted to fly. Less than a year after his marriage, he enrolled as a U.S. Marine Corps aviation cadet under the name Gregory Boynton. There was no record of Gregory Boynton's marriage that also meant he couldn't claim benefits for having a spouse or dependents at the time. But Greg wanted to fly, so he left his army commission behind. By June 1935, he was an inactive member of the United States Marine Corps Reserve. He was assigned to the Naval Air Station Pensacola for pilot training. On March 11, 1937, Boynton was designated a naval aviator and sent to Marine Corps Base Quantico to serve with Aircraft 1, Fleet Marine Force. He was discharged from the Marine Corps the next day. Boynton went to the basic school in Philadelphia from July 1938 until January 1939. After completing the course, he was posted to the 2nd Marine Aircraft Group at the San Diego Naval Air Station. He participated in fleet operations from the aircraft carriers USS Lexington and Yorktown. Boynton was promoted to 1st Lieutenant on November 4, 1940 and returned to Pensacola as an instructor in December. Boynton was constantly looking for new and intriguing opportunities. As Boynton stated in his book, I never completely got out of one situation before getting into another. This posed a difficulty for the family and his three children with Helen. Even before the war, he traveled frequently in search of the next adventure and salary. While he was married for seven years, the financial responsibilities of family life constantly followed him. Boynton, a father who was rarely around, said Helen neglected the children. They were placed with his parents. Their divorce inevitably occurred in 1941. 
flying tigers. The next insane opportunity arose in August 1941. Boynton left his Marine Corps commission to work for the Central Aircraft Manufacturing Company, Camco. Camco was a civilian contractor hired to staff a special air unit to protect China and the Burma Road from the Japanese. This later became known as the American Volunteer Group AVG, also known as the Flying Tigers in Burma. It was not about flying, battling the Japanese, or defending China. Boynton was convinced that because of his money issues and drinking, he would be passed over for captain in the Marine Corps. This opportunity was purely for a payday. Boynton, as usual, was in problems with creditors and the IRS and needed to generate some quick cash. He was sure that flying for Camco would mean easy money. The group had contracts with pay ranging from $250 per month for a mechanic to $750 per month for a squadron commander, which was nearly three times their previous salary in the United States military. Claire Chenault, a retired Army Air Corps officer, came up with the idea for AVG. Camco recruited approximately 300 men, 100 of them were pilots from the Navy, Marines and Army Air Corps. Boynton was assured that if he resigned from AVG, he may be restored with rank in the Marine Corps. This 28-year-old assumed that extra pay for shooting down ill-equipped Japanese planes would keep him afloat financially and he would return to the Corps. He is credited with six air-to-air -air wins during his stint at AVG. As with most aspects of military life, there is a lot of waiting about. Boynton spent those hours arguing with his superior officer, consuming enormous amounts of whiskey, and enjoying local women. Tiger Squadron Airplane Boynton excelled as a flight leader while with the Flying Tigers, but he constantly clashed with his commanding officer, Claire Chenault. This cycle will reoccur throughout his military career. In April 1942, he violated his contract with AVG and returned to the United States on his own. Boynton's eight months in AVG exposed him to real dogfights, Japanese pilots who were adept, and specific flying methods that could save his life. He became a better pilot, but not a better man. Back in the Marine Corps. The United States declared war on AVG on December 7, 1941, following the attack on Pearl Harbor. Boynton was eager to get back into the action with the Marines. He expected the paperwork he signed prior to AVG to be a golden ticket, but it was never going to be that simple. He sought reinstatement and was ordered to return to Washington State and wait. Without a paycheck, clothes, or a purpose, Boynton spent the next three months parking vehicles for 75 cents an hour, the same job he did in high school. After a fifth of bourbon, he penned a three-page letter requesting reinstatement and delivered it to the Assistant Secretary of Navy. That screaming letter may be lost to history, but it had the effect of gaining him active duty orders and eventually returning to the combat in the Pacific. The Solomon Islands. Major Boynton was ordered to the Solomon Islands where the Allies were halting the Japanese advance and attempted to turn the tide and reclaim seized territory. The struggle for Guadalcanal ended in late January 1943. And Operation Cleanslate, the conquest of the Russell Islands, began shortly after. The conquest of these islands was seen by U.S. forces as the first step toward gaining control of the Solomon Islands. It was the initial move toward forcing the Japanese troops out of their strongholds in the region. New Georgia, 170 miles to the north, was a significant objective in the Solomons. Because of this, the Russells were in a favorable position only 25 miles from Guadalcanal. Furthermore, once in U.S. hands, the Russells offered prospective airfields, PT boat bases, and staging grounds for future missions. Airfields became very significant. 
Finally, the Allies could not allow the Japanese to hold the islands because they would constitute a significant threat to Guadalcanal and American operations to the north. The marine attack on the Russell Islands was not as intense as Guadalcanal, but the airstrips were critical to the Allies. As the airstrike forces moved from island to island, providing transport assistance and other responsibilities, Boynton remained without a squadron or an opportunity to combat Japanese fighters. He grabbed the opportunity to reactivate a squadron that had been disbanded due to a lack of planes, components, and pilots. VMF 214 was reconstructed in August 1942 on the island of Espiritu Santo in the New Hebrides. For the first time, Pappy Boynton took charge of the aircraft's 27 pilots. Boynton, at 31 years old, also known as Grandpa or Pappy, was an odd and unconventional leader due to his experience. Marine Attack Squadron 214, VMF 214, Black Sheep Squadron at Turtle Bay Fighter Strip, Espiritu Santo, New Hebrides, September 11, 1943. Giving Flight Directions. Major Gregory Pappy Boynton is seen in the center. A photograph of the United States Navy is currently in the National Archives collection. The VMF 214, often known as the Black Sheep, acquired the Vought F 4UF Corsair fighter. This stunning and fast machine was a pilot's dream. It was quick and responsive, and it did well while in a tight location. The fighter's inverted gull wings gave the aircraft an unmistakable silhouette and were intended to give ground clearance for the huge 13-foot propeller. This improvised unit, lacking the usual stateside training, found the Corsair excellent for the job. Its 2,000-horsepower engine and top speed of 4,465 miles per hour making it one of the fastest planes in the theater. The Corsairs flown by VMF-214 were rarely flown by the same pilot on consecutive days. In fact, in a show of leadership that endeared him to his pilots, Pappy would always fly the jet in the worst condition possible on each mission. The Black Sheep was credited with shooting down 97 Japanese aircraft and destroying another 103 during the squadron's two six-week tours of service, making the Black Sheep one of the highest-scoring aviation units in the South Pacific at the time. Marine Attack Squadron 214, VMF 214, Black Sheep Squadron at Turtle Bay Fighter Strip in Espiritu Santo, New Hebrides. On September 11, 1943, they are photographed just before heading for Munda with an F4U in the background. Major Gregory Pappy Boynton is eighth from the left in the front row. A photograph of the United States Navy is currently in the National Archives collection. Boynton wants to spice things up. He possessed command and experience that should have resulted in a headquarters position. In reality, he frequently argued with one of his group leaders, Colonel Lard, to the point of insubordination. Pappy writes about Lard, but he admits that his book and TV show used the moniker Lard instead of his true antagonist at the time, Lieutenant Colonel Joseph Smoke. The two had crossed paths at flight school and their enmity grew over time. Boynton saw Lard as an overweight bureaucrat and paper pusher. Lard-sized Boynton dressed up as a rule-breaking drunk. At one point, he told Pappy not to drink or he'd be barred from flying. When Lard removed Pappy from command of the company squadron, General James T. Moore intervened, reversed the order, and chastised Lard. Many years later, in 2017, Pappy remarked in a History Net interview, Lieutenant Colonel Joseph Smoke, Operations Office of Marine Air Group 11 was a true by-the-book Marine, but unlike most of the typical backstabbers, he had pulled his time when it counted. He served in China and I admired him for it. I was just the type of officer he couldn't understand. I have no ill will toward him or anyone else. They put good men in Pappy's path, keeping him on track.
Men like General Nuts Moore, Admiral Halsey, General Chesty Puller, and unidentified chaplains. Boynton reflects on his conversations with these guys and many others in Baba Black Sheep. Pappy was a wild card, but he did listen to advice from people he trusted. His admiration for Nuts was genuine and deep. Pappy said, what I appreciated so much was that Nuts more told you the problem and then would sit back and listen while you told him how to go about getting it done. Boynton lived by the leadership principle never send somebody out on a mission that you as squadron commander would not go on yourself and always take the first of what promises to be ugly or bad missions. This endeared him to the squadron but he was constantly in danger. That tension contributed to the drinking, carousing, and insubordination. However, it also resulted in quick aerial battle amongst Zeros. Pappy competed against less experienced Japanese pilots. He piled up kill after kill. He worried that he wouldn't get another chance to shake it up. As he approached World War I ace Eddie Rickenbacker's record of 26 kills, the pressure from the media and press to anticipate when he would acquire the tie-breaking kill increased. Rickenbacker, the original Fast Eddie, was the United States' most successful fighter ace throughout the war and is regarded as the American with the most heroism decorations, including the Medal of Honor, during World War I. Following the war, Rickenbacker became a race car driver. Fate is a curious thing, and retribution is frequently a bitch. On January 3, 1944, in Bougainville, Major Boynton says, I was to lead a fighter sweep over Rabaul, meaning 200 miles over enemy waters and territory again. Happy splashed a zero while protected by a wingman, Captain George Ashmum of New York City, but the wingman was shot down within minutes. The two had been jumped by approximately 20 planes. I could feel enemy fire hitting my armor plate behind my back like hail on a tin roof. I could see the enemy shots moving along my wing tips, making patterns, Boynton remembered. His Corsair engine caught fire, and he had little choice but to draw up which would direct the flames into the cockpit. He was too low to bail out properly, so he pulled the eject stick and flew through the canopy. The chute popped but did not have time to open, so he submerged in the ocean to avoid being strafed by the Zeros. As he drifted in the waves, he assessed his injuries, which included a nearly severed left ear, shattered shrapnel wounds in his arms, shoulder, and left ankle, and a huge portion of left leg muscle missing. He was focused on survival rather than the ace record. He questioned why a higher power would save someone like him. After eight hours, a submarine rescued him from the ocean. As fate would have it, it was a Japanese sub. Five days after Pappy was shot down, the Black Sheep Squadron completed their second combat tour in the Solomons and was dissolved. The pilots were posted to other squadrons and VMF 214's mythology grew on its own. Pappy was presumed to have died. 20 months in prison. When he was rescued by the submarine, his emergency backpack was found with his name stenciled on it. The Marine Aviator Ace's fame preceded him. He was scheduled to serve 20 months in two different camps on Japan's mainland. He, like all other detainees in Axis camps, was malnourished, tortured, interrogated, and mistreated. Ofuna Camp The first camp was located in a Yokohama neighborhood at Ofuna, a Japanese Navy installation. This camp held 70 to 90 special prisoners who the Imperial Navy believed possessed military intelligence that could be extracted. He stayed at Ofuna from March 1944 until April 1945. At this covert intimidation camp, the names of the prisoners were never divulged to the Red Cross, thus the family had no idea someone was alive and no communications or packages were sent from the Red Cross. During this time, he was shown a press release detailing his story and his receipt of the Medal of Honor, as well as the fact that his mother had christened a new carrier. 
He was relieved to learn about his mother and surprised when the interrogator said Japan values heroes and offered him a cigarette. There were tiny gestures of compassion in addition to the severe conditions that resulted in a badly healed ankle, beriberi, starvation, and an 80-pound weight loss, dropping him to 110 pounds. Pappy eventually found himself working in the camp kitchen with a civilian cook making meals for the guards. This gave him the opportunity to steal food for himself and the other inmates. Two of the civilian cooks were aware of the situation and either assisted or turned a blind eye. The extra food enabled him and others to regain weight, health, and survival. Amori Camp The special detainees were transferred from Ofuna, an intelligence camp, to Amori, a work camp. Amori Prison Camp was located on an artificial island in Tokyo Bay connected to the main city by a bamboo slat bridge. This work camp inflicted severe punishment on a daily basis and had some of the most dreaded guards in the nation. Louis Samperini, a former 1936 Olympic track athlete, was among the special captives at Ofuna and Amori alongside Pappy. Zamperini was Jesse Owens' teammate at the Berlin Olympics and he even met Adolf Hitler. Louis was the subject of the best-selling book and feature film, Unbroken. He likewise struggled after the war and returning to the United States, but Louis eventually turned to religion to find peace. He credits his wife with taking him to a Billy Graham revival which opened his heart and allowed him to release the hatred and pain he was carrying. At Amori, days were spent picking up or breaking up rubble in the Yokohama area. The convicts were dressed in rags and lacked the strength to accomplish such physically demanding tasks, but falling behind or taking a break resulted in beatings and berating from the guards. Boynton was always reminded of the appalling conditions in which the regular Japanese he encountered on the streets lived, and he claimed that these citizens treated the POWs with honor. At Amori, the prisoners began to see the end of the war more clearly. The area was bombarded by American B-29 planes. The convicts delighted at the bombing, which they dubbed music, so that the guards would not punish them. The B-29s, a new airframe, had never been seen by the captives, but they inspired wonder and optimism. Even when the end was near, it became impossible for some to hold on. In August 1945, the Amori inmates were unaware of the devastating atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Amori prison guards attempted to explain, but both the guards and the detainees were unable to understand. A guard with family in Nagasaki attempted to explain it, but he did not know English, so Pappy wrote, I didn't fully believe it until after the war. The lack of information was a side effect of being a special hostage. On August 29, 1945, Amori special captives were liberated via Tokyo. The guys were brought to a Tokyo POW camp, Shinjuku, Tokyo Bay Area 35 to 140 until September 12, when they were flown to Hawaii before being transported back to California. Their health and well-being were top priorities, as was military debriefing and dealing with financial and legal issues. Major Gregory Pappy Boynton, USMC, a flying ace who was reported missing for 16 months, is shown after being rescued from a prison camp hospital in Aomori, near Tokyo. Commander Harold E. Stassen, right, greets the Major. Boynton was eventually awarded the Medal of Honor for his actions during the conflict. The photograph is dated August 29, 1945. Awards and Declarations Boynton realized he had gotten the Medal of Honor while being held captive by the Japanese. The nation assumed he dead when his plane was shot down. Boynton received the Navy Cross in December 1945, which he saw as a booby prize and was bestowed with a two-minute ceremony. The President of the United States of America is pleased to present the Navy Cross to Major Gregory Pappy Boynton, MC Sen, 
0 to 5254 United States Marine Corps Reserve for extraordinary heroism and distinguished service in the line of his profession as commanding officer and pilot of Marine Fighting Squadron 214 VMF 214 Marine Air Group 11 MAG 11 First Marine Aircraft Wing during action against enemy aerial forces in the New Britain on January 3, 1944. Major Boynton led a formation of Allied planes on a fighter sweep over Rabaul against a significantly superior number of opposition fighters, capping up a period of service distinguished by extraordinary combat achievement. He made a brave attack on the Rising Zeros, diving into a steep run and destroying one Japanese fighter with flames. Major Boynton, a tenacious and fearless airman in extremely hazardous conditions, was able to communicate to those who served with him the brilliant and effective tactics developed through careful study of enemy techniques, and led his men into combat with inspiring and courageous determination. His intrepid leadership and courageous fighting spirit bring the highest honor to the United States Naval Service. The description of Pappy as a daring, tenacious, fearless, and effective tactician clearly fits Major Boynton. So would hard-headed, stubborn, daredevil, and drunk, but, as previously said, in polite society, defects and imperfections should be ignored in favor of heroism. Medal of Honor Citation For outstanding heroism above and beyond the call of duty as commanding officer of Marine Fighting Squadron 214 against hostile Japanese forces in the Central Solomons area from September 12, 1943 to January 3, 1944. Despite being outnumbered on successive hazardous flights over heavily defended hostile territory, Major Boynton struck at the enemy with daring and courageous persistence, leading his squadron into combat with devastating results for Japanese shipping. Shore installations and aerial forces, Major Boynton, steadfast in his efforts to inflict debilitating damage on the enemy, led a formation of 24 fighters over Kahili on October 17 and continually circled the air dome. Where 60 hostile aircraft were grounded, daring the Japanese to bring up planes. Under his outstanding direction, our fighters destroyed 20 enemy ships in the subsequent battle without losing a single one. A superb airman and determined fighter against overwhelming odds, Major Boynton personally destroyed 26 of the many Japanese planes shot down by his squadron and, through his forceful leadership, developed the combat readiness in his command which was a distinguishing feature of the Allied aerial achievements in this critical strategic area. The following day, then-President Harry S. Truman presented the Medal of Honor, which had been issued posthumously by President Franklin D. Roosevelt. He thought the Medal of Honor ceremony with the other awardees was sufficiently somber and respectful. President Truman said, I would rather have this honor than be President of the United States. Truman had previously served in the Missouri National Guard and was deployed to France with an artillery regiment during World War I. Pappy presumably didn't realize that toward the end of World War I, Truman addressed his soldiers right now. I'm where I want to be in command of this battery. I'd rather be here than as President of the United States. Final Years in the Military For a time, his shortcomings and faults were in remission. He noticed the capture kept him from drinking, which was extremely beneficial to him both emotionally and physically. He had every intention of remaining sober. During the Honolulu stopover, Pappy met up with Major General Nutsmore, who tried to give him excellent advice regarding post-war fame and problems. Moore was nearing the conclusion of his career and had prospects in the civilian sector. Boynton believed he would remain in the Corps, but due to his physical state and the fact that he had been out of operations for more than two years, his military future had an expiry date. Even if he was unaware of it, a war bond tour for Marines did take place, and Medal of Honor recipients were frequently paraded. 
These month-long bond tours were always boring, tiresome, and stressful. As he attempted to picture a future, he was again confronted with financial difficulties. Prior to the war, he put his service pay into a trust for his children. He gave it to a female friend, a drinking gal, only to discover upon his return that it had not been done properly. Neither he nor the children were receiving the full amount due. He should have known you couldn't believe the assurances of a drunk. Lt. Colonel Gregory Boynton, a Medal of Honor recipient, was in high demand at parades, speaking engagements, and meet angrets. With that need came all the trappings of instant and fleeting fame. There is a long history of MH recipients who have turned to alcoholism and bankruptcy due to the stress of their celebrity status. Pappy had brushes with both before becoming a star, but the Medal of Honor fame drew him back into the bottle. His military career ended unexpectedly. The medical board planned a review of his physical condition to allow him to continue serving, most likely in response to internal core foes. The war injuries and POW caused physical issues undoubtedly offered solid grounds for his eventual medical retirement. He was promoted to bird or full colonel before his medical retirement in August 1947. This was a fitting finish to the military career of a Medal of Honor recipient and World War II ace, which had always been risky. Final four decades. One lesson learned from individuals who have received the Medal of Honor and from their time in the Marine Corps is that life goes on for the living long after valor and heroism are required and Semper Fi is the everyday mantra. At the age of 35. This hero was forced to confront his most terrifying adversary, his own shortcomings and weaknesses. His tale does not finish happily like Louis Zamperini's, who discovered God and a purpose in Christian ministry aimed at at-risk kids. Louis was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross, yet he lived a life free of drinking and several marriages. Boyington was frequently plagued by financial troubles. He worked in a variety of sales and marketing positions for several years. Companies attracted to him were frequently financially troubled, thinking that his celebrity would make the difference. His well-known drinking adventures led to him representing a brewery for a time. A drunk should not own a bar or advertise for a brewery, but he needed to earn a living. For many years, he officiated professional wrestling events in California and the neighboring territories. His reputation was boosted, the crowd's adoration was exhilarating, being near the brawling was natural, the money was easy, and he could do the job while stinking drunk. Another defect he returned home with was a revolving marriage that cost him money and energy. When he returned to the United States, he married for the second time in 1946 to a 32-year-old woman. He married for the third time at the age of 47 to a 33-year-old woman. In 1978, at the age of 66, he married for the fourth and final time to Josephine Wilson, who was 51 at the time, and the marriage lasted 10 years until his death from terminal cancer in 1988. She lived another four years and died at the age of 62. One can only hope that somewhere down the Marshall Road, Pappy discovered real love or something close to it. Boynton remarked, while discussing newspaper stardom, but it appears true of his personal life, for all this was not sufficient for a man who just wanted to be wanted, and for some reason or another had felt that he had never been since childhood. Pappy had been a favorite target of the press in the late 1940s and 1950s due to his numerous faults, foibles, and marriages. However, he eventually faded from constant unfavorable news coverage and his image was boosted in the 1970s with the television premiere of Ba Ba Black Sheep. It helped a lot since beautiful and popular actor Robert Conrad played Boynton. From 1976 to 1978, Conrad achieved rating success as famed tough guy World War II fighter ace Pappy Boynton in Ba Ba Black Sheep, which is still regularly seen on cable TV. The show's success earned Conrad a People's Choice Award for Favorite Male Actor and a Golden Globe nomination for his performance. Boynton, who desired to be wanted, must have felt vindicated even if he lambasted the play for its lack of realism and Hollywood hokum. Pappy's health ultimately caught up with him ten years after the show aired. He acquired terminal cancer and died in January 1988. His fourth wife accompanied him during hospice and at the end. 
He had witnessed one child's suicide, but his son graduated from the United States Air Force Academy in 1960 and retired as a lieutenant colonel. Boynton had several accomplishments and regrets. Colonel Gregory Pappy Boynton's life serves as both inspiration and a cautionary story. He had witnessed one child's suicide, but his son graduated from the United States Air Force Academy in 1960 and retired as a lieutenant colonel. Boynton had several accomplishments and regrets. Colonel Gregory Pappy Boynton's life serves as both inspiration and a cautionary story. Greatness can be achieved by those who have defects and shortcomings. Overcoming those shortcomings requires brilliance. Friends and allies frequently offer sound counsel that might be difficult to hear and implement. Only you can achieve serenity and recognize that you are wanted. We poured our hearts and souls into each frame, hoping to take you on a mesmerizing journey through time. We're glad to hear your opinions. Did you enjoy the video? Was it informative, interesting, or perhaps even inspirational? We would love to hear from you in the comments section below. And if you haven't already, please consider joining our community by subscribing to our channel. And if you haven't already, please consider joining our community by subscribing to our channel. By clicking the bell button, you'll be kept up to speed on all of our latest releases, ensuring that you never miss out on another intriguing journey into the past. But wait, there's more. We want to hear from you. Do you have a particular historical topic that piques your interest? Leave us a comment with your thoughts and who knows? Your suggestion may be the inspiration for our next video. So, friends, when you say goodbye, remember to like, comment, subscribe, and ring the bell. Your support means everything to us and we can't wait to go on this historic trip alongside you. Until next time, be interested, stay connected, and continue to discover the treasures of our shared past. Cheers!